Good afternoon or good morning, everyone here in the US, and good evening or good night to those of you who are joining us from elsewhere. Uh, my name is Tun Shen. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History and the deputy director of the Sakup Sabanjo Center for Turkish Studies here at Columbia University. It is a distinct pleasure and honor for me to welcome you all to our panel today. And with our three distinguished panelists, we will have a conversation on the history of Turkish studies at Columbia University. Today's panel is indeed a part of the series of conversations we plan to run on area studies and the Middle East. The first panel on the origins of Middle East studies in the US initially scheduled for last Friday had to be postponed. We had sent a note through our listserv and social media accounts about the uh, event's postponement, but it seems that some of our registered participants haven't received this message. We sincerely apologize if we caused any inconvenience, and we are hoping to reschedule that event for the spring semester. Before, our, uh, before introducing our speakers today, I would like to say a few words of thanks. First to Sakup Sabanja family. It is thanks to them we have this great center for promoting Turkish studies here in New York at Columbia University. I would also like to thank the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, particularly the current president, Professor Baki Tezcan, for co-sponsoring our event today. I'd like to thank Sharon Kim, our former program manager, and Ararat Shekarian, our new program manager, for their logistical support. And finally, I would like to thank everybody in the audience for being with us today, and I'd like to encourage you to join the conversation with your questions. After the presentations, we will open the floor for your questions. Please raise your virtual hands, and we will let you address your questions to our panelists. So let me introduce you our three speakers today. The first speaker is Ahmed Evin, who is Professor Emeritus and founding Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Sabanji University. He received his BA and PhD degrees at Columbia University, BA in 1966 in English and Comparative Literature and PhD in 1973 in Middle East Studies and Cultural History. Professor Evin has taught at Harvard, NYU, University of Pennsylvania, where he also was the director of the Middle East Center, the University of Hamburg and Bilkent University. He has authored or edited over 10 volumes on politics, culture, and development, and currently serves on the editorial boards of five international journals. As a Jean Monnet professor, Professor Evin has held the Jean Monnet Chair of European Policy Studies, as well as the Anna Lind Lakasha Chair for Euro-Mediterranean Studies at Saban University. Professor Evin has been a senior fellow of the Transatlantic Academy in DC and the Foreign Policy, uh, and the Alexander Onassis Senior Fellow at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy in Athens. He currently serves on the advisory board of Columbia Global Centers Istanbul, senior advisory board of the NATO Defense College Foundation in Rome, University Council of the American University of Bulgaria, advisory board of the Turkey program at Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, and international advisory board of the Institute of Advanced Studies in Kosek. Our second speaker is Peter Golden, Professor Emeritus of History, Turkish and Middle Eastern Studies, and former director of Middle East Studies program at Rutgers University. He taught there from 1969 until his retirement in 2012. He received his MA and PhD from Columbia University in 1968 and 1970 respectively, with a dissertation on the Khazars. He also studied at the Diltarik Geografia Fakultesi, the Faculty of Letters in Ankara, Turkey. Professor Golden is a leading authority in the history of the Turkic peoples of medieval Eurasia and in Turkic philology. He has an impressive list of publications, and I should just mention here some of the books, including 
Hazar studies in two volumes, an introduction to the history of the Turkic peoples and Central Asia in world history, all of which were translated into Turkish. Collections of some of his articles are Nomads and their neighbors in the Russian steppe, Turks, Khazars, and Kupchaks, Turks and Khazars, origins, institutions, and interactions in pre Mongol Eurasia, and studies on the peoples and cultures of the Eurasia steppes. In 2019, Professor Golden was elected to honorary membership in the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And our third speaker is uh, Yulai Shamilodu who is a professor and chair in the Department of Kazakh Language and Turkic Studies at Nazarbayev University in Nur Sultan in Kazakhstan. We would specifically thank the Professor Shamilolu to stay this late uh, for joining uh, today's panel with us. Uh, professor Shamilolu is also the director of the PhD in Eurasian Studies program at Nazarbayev University. Uh, he received his BA in Middle East Languages and Cultures from Columbia College in 1979 with a concentration in Turkish studies and his PhD in Middle Eastern and Central Asian history from Columbia University again in 1986. So we have three panelists who received their degrees, PhD degrees from uh, Columbia University. Uh, Professor Shamilolu studied um, at Zeged University in Hungary in fall 1982. He has taught previously at Indiana University Bloomington and at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he is now Professor Emeritus. His main research interests include the Turkic languages and cultures of the Middle East and Central Asia, the socioeconomic history of the Middle East and Central Eurasia in the medieval period, the history of Turco-Islamic civilization, and modern intellectual movements among the Muslim Turkic peoples of the Ottoman and Russian empires. Since the late 1980s, Professor Shamil Oldu has also been interested in the role of the bubonic plague in the history of medieval central Eurasia, especially the impact of plague on the history of populations, literary languages, religiosity, and written monuments. So before handing the podium over to my esteemed colleague and Sakib Sabanji, visiting professor of Turkish studies, Professor Zeynep Çelik, I will now turn to uh, Professor Barki Tezcan, the president of uh, Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, who has a few things to say on the fifth, current 50th anniversary of OTSA. Yes, Professor Thank Tezcan, you. the floor is Thank you. Thank you so much, Tunç. I will keep myself very brief because we are already 10 minutes after. I simply wanted to share a, a two video clips, uh, video recordings. I actually put them both on the chat now. Uh, if you can copy and paste them on a document that you have, you could watch those recordings later. They happen to be both uh, emeriti professors who also have Columbia PhDs, who happen to be uh, the uh, earlier uh, the second president, and I think the sixth or seventh president of OTSA, um, uh, Joseph uh, Shilovich and Alan Fisher. Uh, Alan Fisher, I think, is in the audience today. He might join the conversation later. It, this year is our 50th anniversary, and one of the things that we are doing is uh, we are releasing interviews that we did uh, with our past presidents. Uh, we released these two. There's going to be a third one coming up in January with uh, Bill uh, Griswold. Uh, this is only one of the things that we're trying to do. We're also trying to document uh, our past officers. And we in, uh, also would like to see events just like this one that Tunch and uh, Zeynep and them very kindly organized that would highlight the long history of Ottoman and Turkish studies in North America. OTSA was founded in 1971, but uh, the history of uh, Ottoman and Turkish studies goes even further back, as you will hear today. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you so much for being here. And please forgive me, I'm going to leave right around, um, uh, you know, about in half an hour or so, because we have a board meeting. Uh, I have to be there uh, for that. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you once again. I would also like to welcome you warmly and thank everybody, and especially Professors Evin Golden and Shamil Oldu for accepting our invitation. 
I'm very pleased to be turning to the history of Turkish studies at Columbia University, indeed in the United States, as we plan to do in the near future in collaboration with OTSA, which has already begun the process. To start the conversation, I have a few questions to our guests. These are not meant to control the presentation, but to raise some general issues. Please feel free to address them at your convenience, and there is no specific order. So here are my few questions. What were the goals in establishing the program? What was the historic and political context? And I believe this is really, really important. My third question is, were there other such programs or were we a lonely group of Turks there? Which disciplines were included under the umbrella term of Turkish studies? Who were the major actors? What was the range of courses offered? How about the students? Where did they come from? Were they graduates or undergraduates? Why were they interested in Turkey? I'm also very curious about female studies and I have some anecdotal information on that. Finally, were there exchanges with Turkish universities and Turkish scholars? Thank you. I would like to pass the word on to Professor Evin now. Thank you very much. It's a uh, great pleasure and honor to uh, be a uh, part, uh, to be a part of this um, series of uh, meetings. Uh, at the end of which, I think we uh, may be able to chart more clearly uh, the uh, history of Turkish studies and how that fit uh, both into the uh, design of uh, Colombia and also um, in uh, the higher educational, uh, among the higher educational institutions in the United States. Uh, let me start with a, a personal note of my uh, entry into this uh, field at uh, Columbia I did not entail crossing any borders or changing cities. I uh, was an undergraduate at Columbia and uh, simply went uh, from the south of College Walk to the north of College Walk to Kent Hall. Um, but I found a quite a different ambiance there. It was vastly different from uh, the undergraduate quad. Uh, quad. Um, and uh, it, it, the, uh, the student population in Kent Hall represented only a very small fraction of uh, what uh, Hamilton Hall had uh, as the center of humanities education in the college. Another uh, difference was that uh, Kent Hall had been uh, housing the law school uh, and um, the law school had moved a few years before into the new building. Uh, but Kent Hall had the aura of um, a distinguished Wall Street firm, uh, law firm with uh, uh, mahogany furniture, not only in offices, but uh, also in seminar rooms. It was uh, lion did not roar uh, in Kent Hall as it did on south side of uh, College Walk. But more remarkable was the number of internationally famous uh, scholars, senior members of the faculty covering um, the field and uh, the uh, disciplines. The student faculty ratio uh, there, uh, in particular in Turkish studies, could not be imagined on any campus today. Um, that was, of course, uh, largely due to the fact that uh, the programs did not have under, undergraduate uh, degree uh, programs. They did not include um, undergraduate degree programs. But the Turkish program then boasted five faculty members, uh, three tenured professors, 
uh, one senior visiting professor from Turkey uh, each year, one junior faculty member, uh, and in addition to uh, a language instructor or a teaching assistant. It thus offered uh, a, a, a extraordinary opportunities uh, for graduate students in terms of access to renowned scholars. Uh, by access, I mean, I remember uh, waiting in line uh, 55 minutes to uh, see a distinguished uh, scholar of English literature in his office hour. Uh, we had the luxury in Kent Hall of uh, having almost immediate access to uh, uh, our professors. It offered opportunities for engaging in field research or language learning abroad and uh, to work with faculty in ancillary disciplines through the regional institutes. By the time I entered graduate school, area studies had reached its golden age at Columbia uh, and uh, in the United States uh, by that time, but Columbia had been the leading institution to build scholarly depth and institutional breadth in area studies. Turkish studies was established in 52, 1952. It was a part of the university's grand design for area studies as an integral part of a new school for international affairs. Teaching and research in the school would be sustained by the study of language, history, and culture. The formal establishment of the Center for Turkish Studies just about seven decades ago coincided with the appointment of Tibor Halashikun, a Hungarian Turkologist who had been recruited from Ankara where he had been teaching. Halashikun was the key person and mentor to a generation of scholars. Much more will be said about him both by Peter Golden, who co collaborated with him for many years in editing Archivum Ottomanicum and uh, another publication on medieval um, uh, Central Asia. And also by Uri Shamliolu, who has uh, published and is preparing in another volume on Halashikun. Let me then continue um, uh, a little bit uh, further with the context, uh, Columbia context uh, in the, uh, the, at the time of the establishment of uh, Turkish studies. It was right at the end of the Second World War in 1945, when the trustees actually established the School of International Affairs and along with it, institutes of regional studies. The university president then said about the international affairs, said it is the first in this country to provide integrated training on the graduate level in international business, economics, and government. Skylar Wallace, a prominent political scientist, was named the school's first director, and he began laying the foundation of the school and its satellites, the institutes. Columbia's educational policy, uh, educational and policy engagement in world affairs was enhanced with the appointment of General Eisenhower as university president in 1950. Eisenhower himself founded the American, Acad uh, the American Assembly uh, the Columbia think tank that is now located, I'm, I'm sorry, the American Academy, the Columbia think tank that is now located in the same building as the Sacrum Savanta Center for Turkish Studies. It was conceived at that time as a forum of leaders, professionals and experts to address the increasingly complicated social and political problems of the mid 20th century. The American Assembly focused on four topics that related to the building of post-war order. These four uh, 
uh, two of them are um, very much in the in line um, and related to uh, area studies. One was, of course, democratic government at the uh, uh, time uh, of um, uh, bipolar world and beginning of the Cold War. Issues of global governance, including US relations with the rest of the world. The other two, uh, one domestic uh, discussions leading to uh, public health and uh, health policy in the United States, and certainly higher education as a driver to, um, uh, to work on these challenges and to meet those challenges. It was probably General Eisenhower who encouraged Schuyler Wallace to visit Ankara to seek support for Turkish studies at Columbia. At that time, Fuad Köprü, a prominent Turkologist and professor of Turkish literature, had become Turkey's foreign minister. He had become Turkey's foreign minister in 1950. Köprü supported the idea of such a center at Columbia. And as a result, Columbia received an annual grant that allowed for uh, a rotating visiting professorship and other activities for the center that was established. Columbia thus also built distinguished collection in Turkish, Turkic, Ottoman books and materials. The history of how that collection has been built, I think needs further research and it needs to be written. The confluence of several other factors supported the strengthening of language and area studies at Columbia. In connection with the American Academy, I should mention the Arden House. Avril Harriman and his brother deeded this vast property to Columbia University in 1950 to be used by the American Assembly. Harriman had coordinated lend -lease program during the war. And later, he also coordinated the Marshall Plan as uh, Secretary of Commerce. He also served as ambassador to Moscow and then as Under Secretary of State. He became an influential supporter of John Kennan's containment policy. Arden House thus became a prestigious conference venue where post-war world order was debated and to a large extent designed. Second, Columbia's New York location also provided an opportunity for close cooperation with the UN. Columbia faculty members, two political scientists, as I recall, were involved in drafting the UN charter. The university saw the UN as a key institution in cooperation with which to pursue its international programs and ambitions as a global educational actor. Nor were Colombia's international commitments driven exclusively by political, developmental, economic, or security considerations. Jacques Barzin, who as Seth Lowe Professor of History established cultural history as a discipline. He emphasized the New York location of the university as an asset for teaching languages. From 1955, as Dean of the Graduate Faculties, as the graduate school was then called, and then as Dean of Faculty and Provost, he was an effective champion of liberal arts and deplored what he called the gangrene of specialism. Those were his words. When he was provost, 63 languages were taught at Columbia. Let me briefly mention three other factors that enabled students to pursue graduate work in language and area studies. One was National Defense Education Act, everyone knows about it. The GI Bill, although uh, the GI Bill expired a long time ago, we still uh, 
refer to veterans uh, uh, support programs, uh, uh, the name GI Bill, um, over 2 million uh, veterans um, uh, got higher educational degrees through um, GI, uh, the GI Bill and its uh, uh, later uh, versions. And the Peace Corps uh, that allowed uh, young Americans to have a first-hand experience and then come to graduate school knowing the languages uh, or at least one language and, and uh, one country very well. Turkish studies substantially benefited from these programs. This briefly is the context in which Turkish studies developed at Columbia. Apart from Tibor Harashikun, I mentioned uh, five, uh, uh, four, uh, three professorships and uh, a junior professorship. One was Carl Menges, professor of Altaic philology, Edward Allworth, uh, who was uh, the person in Turco Soviet studies, but essentially he uh, focused on Central Asia, uh, Turkic uh, peoples, languages, and um, uh, and cultures. Kathleen Burrell, who had come from the British Council in Ankara to get her PhD at Columbia in Ottoman literature and uh, was then appointed uh, as uh, assistant professor. And uh, the rotating professorship uh, that uh, allowed prominent Turkish academics to contribute to the center and the institute. Members of the Institute also shared the top floor of Kent Hall with Turkologists, Arabicists, Persianists. The medieval Arab historian Douglas Morton Dunlop and the Islamic law scholar Joseph Schacht had their offices in the same corridor as the Institute director John Badeau, the former US ambassador to Egypt, and Jay Hurwitz, the diplomatic historian of the modern Middle East. A towering intellectual was uh, Charles Esaoui, who was a uh, Ragnar Nurksi professor of economics at Columbia. One thing about Charles Esaoui is that uh, he reflected the best of the intellectual universe that Columbia uh, had. At that time, he was a petroleum economist recruited from the United Nations. But apart from his numerous uh, articles on economics and three major uh, books on the economic history of, of the Middle East, he had published a variety of literary and historical essays, including English translation of Herder's poetry, an article on Oxford in Jane Austen's novels and a translation of a selection of Ibn Khaldun's history with his own introduction. Charles Isavi and Jacques Barzin represented the rich intellectual universe of Columbia, which would incorporate a specific subject such as Turkish into the broader concerns, not only of liberal arts, but even the professions. I will stop here. I have personal memories of each of these uh, figures in Turkish studies, in uh, the Institute, in political science and, and economics. Maybe time will permit to share some of these with you later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Evan, for this uh, wonderful historical context uh, uh, for the formation of the Turkish Studies program here at Columbia University. Let us turn now to Professor Golden to hear his recollections and insights and comments on uh, the earlier decades of the Turkish Studies program at Columbia.
Can you unmute yourself, Professor Golden? Okay, I thought I. Yes, now. All right. Okay. Hear. Okay. <laughs> uh, computers, uh, one uh, can't live without them, and one can't live with them, uh, <laughs> as I've discovered all too often. Uh, uh, Ahmed did a wonderful job of, of, uh, of giving the general uh, picture. Um, I thought I might say a few uh, words a little bit more, uh, I guess, autobiographical in nature because I, I went through um, a kind of series until I got into Turkic studies. Um, I entered uh, Colombia in 1963 in the Russian Institute. And I did that because I was interested in medieval Russian history and Byzantine history. And as part of my family background, I spoke Russian with my, with my grandparents, a peasant dialect, <laughs> but uh, one useful enough. Uh, and, I, and I still have that peasant accent, uh, haven't lost it. Um, and um, I, my first, uh, my first advisor was Ihor Shevchenko, who was a very famous Byzantinist and uh, uh, medieval Slavist. And I remember in uh, in our first discussion um, about what I would be doing, and uh, we were speaking in Russian. This was the, normally the language we spoke when we were uh, together and without others around, and. Uh, I explained what I'd been reading, what my interests were, and what directions. And he looked at me and he said, He said, you'll be an Orientalist. I had some vague idea what that meant. Uh, it's not in the, in the current sense in English. In Russian, it has a rather more specific meaning, uh, namely uh, one, someone who uses Eastern sources to understand medieval Russian, early medieval Russian history, the history of Rus. And uh, so I, I worked with him. In the meantime, apparently he saw that I was interested in a great many other things. I'd begun to study Georgian. Uh, I was the only student. <laughs> and there was one student, I think, at, at each level, into uh, uh, elementary, intermediate, and advanced. Uh, and it was taught by Georgi Nakashidze, who was uh, himself a walking monument of Georgian history. Um, who had uh, been involved in the politics of that time, had been imprisoned, uh, had been released um, in exchange for communists who were being held in Germany, um, and who used to, uh, he walked with a limp and he would say, yes, here it is bullet from Turks, here is bullet from Russians. He, he was uh, a walking history of of the, uh, the period 1918 to 1922, um, uh, more or less. Uh, so I worked with him and I was thinking about, well, maybe I'd, I'd do that. Um, I had a lot of contact with uh, Nina Garsoyan, who's not uh, been mentioned here, who was an outstanding armenologist. So she was at, at Columbia only part-time. She didn't become full-time until, until uh, much later. In my day, she was there kind of, uh, kind of part-time, uh, giving a range of courses, not just in Armenian language, but uh, in, um, uh, in Armenian history uh, and related topics. Um, I, interest, I never worked with Horowitz. I worked for him. <laughs> I translated Russian treaties for him. <laughs> It was a summer job I got after my first year. I had been taking courses with Raev and he said, uh, he recommended me to Horowitz. And so I, I, I became a de facto research assistant uh, as well as translator of, of uh, Russian treaties. Um, it was rather interesting working in the law library where they had uh, the uh, the editions of uh, these treaties and um, uh, so on. Um, and it was very useful for me because he wrote wonderful letters of recommendation, <laughs> uh, which, uh, and in those days one got, one got fellowships or scholarships that were one year in duration usually, and you reapplied every year. And I eventually, instead of 
So I had I uh, I had been awarded a national defense. I went with the Foreign Area Fellowship Foundation, which I don't think is any more, any longer in existence. Uh, it was founded by Ford Foundation. It was I think five dollars less per month. But I said, all right, I'm not beholden to the government uh, <laughs> if I do this. And the government was present. We used to joke in those days, this was before the, the international affairs building went up. Uh, we were in um, uh, little uh, brownstones uh, on the 117th Street, as I recall, off of Amsterdam. And uh, you could spot people from Washington coming and they all seemed to dress alike. They bought the same raincoats and wore the same kind of fedoras. Uh, and we knew, up oh, CIA is here. Uh, the FBI is here, and uh, every now and again, they attempted to recruit people, uh, some of whom uh, I know that uh, uh, some of the secretaries or administrative assistants had been formerly um, CIA. And I remember once uh, one casually said to me, you know, Peter, we could parachute you into Belarus and nobody would know. <laughs> because I speak with that local accent. I said, but I would know. <laughs> and so I'll, uh, I, I, I'll prefer, I prefer to do that at another time. Uh, so uh, I went with the Foreign Area Fellowship Foundation and in Shevchenko and Holoshikun had meantime begun to talk. I had taken courses with, with Dunlop in medieval Arab history. I'd done uh, history of Transcaucasia. Uh, and I had taken Ottoman history with Halashi Kuhn, uh, where he saw I was interested in things that he was interested in. Uh, because Hungarian Turkology, and uh, I think it's, it's interesting to note, uh, uh, grew out of uh, the interest in Hungarian origins. Uh, and so that everyone was given a kind of a, an area to work with, Turkic sources, Semitic sources, uh, Transcaucasian sources, and there were different people who did uh, different areas. They became specialists themselves in those areas, but also how they could be applied to, uh, to Hungarian proto-history, which was one of the ways they translated uh, this, this term, Hong uh, and So um, it was, uh, Behind my back, there were these discussions going on. And finally, uh, they said to me, all right, uh, what would you like to do for your dissertation purposes? I said, well, what I'd like to do, I'd like to study all of these things. I'm interested in, <laughs> in the medieval Middle East. I'm interested in Transcaucasia. Uh, I'm interested in increasingly in the Turkic world. And I said, well, you, you can't do all of them uh, at the same time. Uh, though I've tried to in my scholarship, uh, uh, you have to choose one. And so I said, all right, I'll do Turkic studies. And off I was sent uh, to Ankara, uh, where I worked with Hassan Aran, who was uh, himself a, a Turk from uh, Vidin, who had gotten his PhD in Hungary. So there was, again, the Hungarian connection. Then I worked with also with Sadat Çağatay, who was the daughter of a very famous Tatar poet. And I did the Kupchak dialects with her. And with Zainab Korkmaz, who, uh, mashallah, is still alive. <laughs> uh, she's got to be nearing 100. Uh, <laughs> she's the only one of my professors who is still above ground. Uh, and uh, uh, she was extremely interesting. And um, uh, I worked with her on Anatolian dialects. Uh, and in the course of various things, I also did uh, Old Turkic, Ancient Turkic, read the Orkhon inscriptions, uh, and so on. Though Ahmed and I did it also with Menges. Uh, when I came back from Turkey, <laughs> uh, Ahmed and I were, were two students. Uh, I think we, there were three originally. We ended up the only two uh, who did Orkhon. We read, we read maybe 12 lines altogether because for every word, Menges would stop and then give a dissertation on the, the etymological implications of this word uh, and uh, what the Dravidian form might be and uh, various other things. 
and you you went not to learn old Turkic, you went to listen to Menges because he was brilliant, he was flashing with ideas, uh, and he was an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary scholar. Uh, he had very few students, I might add, uh, but his classes were, were he did a, did a course in Central Asia that had a, 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 a full uh, grouping of, uh, of students. Uh, so I came back uh, from, uh, from Ankara, though, with a side trip uh, to Hungary, where I spent time with, uh, with Nemet and Rona Tash and a group of other uh, many. I met all the Hungarian uh, Turkologists, basically. Uh, Ligeti, who was uh, the, the great Altaicist Mongolist, and with whom I would later uh, collaborate on a project. Uh, uh, and um, uh, and a number of others. And then I, I went to Poland and I was with Zajinczkowski, who was a uh, uh, first rate uh, Turkologist, uh, Kupchakologist, and of course, uh, dealing with his native Karaim, uh, Turkic language. Um, and then I went off to, to Russia to see relatives. <laughs> no scholarly purposes involved, just spent time with uh, several weeks with relatives running around. Uh, uh, so, uh, the background to all of this, as Ahmed said, and as I've often said to friends, the Cold War paid for my uh, graduate education. Um, uh, who else would take Georgian? For what purpose? Uh, I was interested in it. And of course, they were only too happy to pay for it, uh, <laughs> whether it was national defense or foreign area fellowship, uh, because they could they. they the Foreign Area Fellowship had a had a map of, 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 of the world and they had flags where they had uh, their different uh, students. Um, at that time, it was virtually impossible for American students or anyone else to get to Turkic Central Asia. Uh, even Transcaucasia was, uh, was uh, a real leap. Uh, there was one fellow whose name I have forgotten. It was Tom something or other, not Tom Goodrich, who I knew who was a uh, uh, the son of a famous sinologist and, and, and a wonderful uh, Ottomanist, uh, some other fellow who did event was the first one uh, to, to get to Central Asia. He was reputed to be a CIA agent, and he died several years later under circumstances that have never been quite explained. Uh, so <laughs> uh, Colombia has its many tales to tell, uh, not all of which will perhaps see the light of day. Uh, the preparation was very interesting, and here I will say uh, a few more concrete things. And, that, and I know it not from Middle Eastern studies, because I was not in the Middle Eastern Institute, uh, but rather I, was, I had begun in the Russian Institute. And there they were very serious about your having this, this, this broad array. You did history. Uh, you did uh, literature. Uh, you did uh, foreign affairs. Uh, domestic affairs. I took Soviet politics with Brzezinski, <laughs> uh, not a bad fellow to learn uh, from. Um, and then I did uh, foreign affairs with Dalian, uh, who also then later went on to Stanford, who was a very well-known figure then. I didn't know then that, that his father was from the same little town that my grandparents came from. Had I known, perhaps uh, I might have had even uh, uh, I did well with him, but you know, uh, might have had more interesting time. Uh, so it was, and uh, uh, it was a very interesting period, very interesting group. Um, 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 the place, the Russian Institute, and and then uh, the where seminars were held. It had a very Eastern European feeling about it not U.S. I mean, they were in these old brownstones. Uh, uh, kind of falling apart uh, and uh, with, uh, with hearing various Eastern European languages uh, uh, spoken all around you. Uh, so it was, it was an ideal place to learn. Um, and uh, there was just about everything. Oh, the languages, again, uh, Tatar was being offered there. Uh, Uzbek, of course, was being offered there. Uh, uh, Allworth was one of the early students of Uzbek. Um, they all uh, would disappear in time, uh, 
but uh, they were quite uh, prominent then. Well, I perhaps uh, should should uh, stop here, and uh, there there'll probably be questions afterwards. Uh, but it was uh, during my time there from '63 uh, until I went off to teach at Rutgers in '69. Uh, um, it was simply a a wonderful place for learning, uh, with tremendous possibilities, and of course a library that was incomparable uh to other institutions uh, uh, one thing i should add halashi kun always used to say that it was based that the whole thing was based on the german politische hochschule uh, that the whole idea of having institutes with these separate programs and the rest really was not an american invention it was something that they had picked up from central europe and then made a part of uh of uh the columbia uh, system. Well, okay, I'll I'll end with that. Thank you, Professor Golden, for this very engaging presentation. Uh, now the floor is Professor Shamil Oldus. If you permit me and you humor me for five ten seconds, I will share a picture, uh -huh. and I, I want you to understand that I entered Colombia at the age of 17. And I basically began working with HK, with Tibor Halashikun, uh, I think, or I certainly knew him as a first semester freshman. This was, you know. So I don't know if you want to laugh or you cry, but here we are today. And I'll go back to just blurring, no, I'll go back to blurring my background. So, so part of what I'd like to discuss is my experience as an undergraduate uh, from 1975 to 1979, uh, from 1979 to 1975, uh, 79, and then uh, continuing taking courses at uh, Columbia as a graduate student working under Richard Bullitt uh, from 79 to 82. And then after I passed my uh, prelims in the fall of 82, I was on an IREX fellowship in Seged, Hungary, and Hala Shikun was also there with, with, with uh, Eve uh, for that semester. So I got to spend time uh, visiting him every other week uh, in Budapest as well. And then from 83 on, uh, I was working at Indiana. And so except for the summer back uh, before starting as a lecturer uh, at uh, Indiana, I prob that was probably the last one I had good quality interaction with them. And uh, I also drove out with them to a conference at, uh, organized by uh, Ilhan Boschkos at, um, at Indiana. And so after that, you know, it was phone calls and so on. And uh, I really broke his heart because he could not be uh, a part of my uh, PhD defense in December 85, but he was in, in Hungary again. So I was a very deeply impressionable young man. And I, I'm not going to make this autobiographical, but I should say, that uh, the reason that I met him on the at during lunch before my very first day as a class, a, a first day of class as an undergraduate, was because Azamat Altai, who was bibliographer uh, at Columbia, uh, Kyrgyz, was friend of my Kazan Tatar family, and so he invited me to lunch. And of course, now in hindsight, uh, since hindsight is twenty twenty, he, he took me there to the Green Tree Restaurant because he probably knew Hala Shikun is there every Tuesday, um, and. So, the, but the reason I, I, I asked to be introduced to him because he said, oh, this is our famous Turkologist, Tibor Hollis, was because I had heard his name in high school from the chair of the Department of Social Studies uh, at Bronx High School of Science, Maritza Tsagos, who had studied Turkish with him decades earlier. So this man who was the first student of Dula Neymet, and perhaps I was Halashikun's last student, depending on how you count, was a charismatic figure. He was a, a gentleman, a charming human being, a very generous teacher and scholar. And so people who studied Turkish with him in the 60s or the 50s still remembered that, that this was still very formative and influential upon them. And if you saw those pictures, that picture that I showed you, and consider that my mission in life is in a way continuing the mission of Tibor Halashikun and also Richard Bullitt in an academic sense uh, in the field of Turkic studies, that I have this passion for things Turkic 
that I see teaching Turkic studies as my mission, the fact that uh, I, okay, not to say anything bad about Indiana University, Bloomington, I had, a, I had let's say six years there working under Gustav Byerly, who was one of uh, Halashikun's students too. Uh, Alan Fisher mentioned him in his video on YouTube. And then, you know, working hard to develop PhD programs at UW Madison uh, and, and teaching overload to be able to teach graduate students and everything. And now having the honor to develop a department of Kazakh language and Turkic studies in Nazarbayev. I get this passion because of Tibu Hala Shikun. That's where, this, that's where this comes from. I mean, I had my background of previous things, what, what my family gave me, but th that man imprinted himself on this 17 year old. And so for, for uh, many years, I had the honor of taking some of his courses. And I'd like to say a few words about what it meant to be an undergraduate in MILAC in Middle East languages and cultures and concentrating in Turkish studies, because I think it's important to keep that in mind and to remember it and maybe try to recreate it. Um, but th this, was, this was awesome. I mean, I cannot believe how fortunate I was in hindsight. And God help me if I had gotten into Harvard or something like that and gone there, ooh, what, what would have happened? I don't know, I would have been chewed up either at the undergraduate or the graduate level. And I think Columbia was absolutely unique. Uh, so, uh, so I should say, so of the many things that, that changed my life was that at the end of my uh, freshman year, he said, you know, your French isn't good enough. You need to go to Paris. So. But God bless my parents who were, were working class Tatar immigrants in the in, formerly in the Bronx then of Yonkers. Uh, they were able to send me. And so of course, not only did I know, I saw Menges my first semester, he retired after that. And in, not only would I later study with, with, with uh, Kathleen Burrell and take a course with Allworth uh, and, and actually know Gustav Rubil for other reasons, uh, et cetera. You know, he had the, the idea to, to, to that this young boy has some potential. Uh, it's not that he never raised his voice at me because as he said, you know, you come with a background and then pretty soon those Iowa boys, they beat you. And so I was, I, until I got the hang of what it is to study literary Turkish uh, uh, because I was coming to it from Kazan Tatar and there were all kinds of false friends and so on. But uh, so, so, uh, you know, I met, Port, you know, Alexander Benningson, Jean-Louis Becker, Carmon, Pertev Naili, Boratov, uh, uh, the son of, of the famous Topchabashi Top and all kinds of other people. And that's just because of one, one thing. And so I, I, one of the takeaways I have from, from Peter and from other colleagues I know about is that in some ways it was a very highly tailored graduate education. Uh, and that's not what I experienced, but I had the, the privilege of beginning as a freshman or sophomore, being exposed to the kind of education that the graduate students were also being uh, provided. And so actually, uh, you know, because of that, the day I got my BA, I actually had completed the PhD language requirements in MILAC, which was one of the reasons that I moved to history as well, because there wasn't that much for me to do. And of course, Kathleen Burrow really hated me for it for many, many years. She wouldn't talk to me for many, many years, but then we became friends later. Um, that's an AATT comment as well. For, for all of our friends from AATT who are listening. And so what did it, so, so, it, it, so for, for me, I, I had the access to graduate level courses. And so I started going on the path of doing the undergraduate major in MILAC with a concentration in Turkish and you know, doing serial language uh, study, you know, studying Arabic and uh, Ottoman Turkish as a junior uh, and so on. And it was just amazing amazing that I had that kind of education at the same as part of an undergraduate Columbia education. I don't know when that began to, began to be possible. Perhaps in 1952 when Hala Shikun arrived, it was not possible. Uh, he was one of the persons who established the help establish the Middle East Institute, MILAC, Near and Middle East Monographs, Archivo Motomanicum, Archivo Mirazi, Meiji Avi, and ARIT, uh, and so on. Uh, the American Research Institute in Turkey. It's just really incredible what he did. Uh, and maybe that's the burden his, his students, former students are bearing uh, as well. But what did it mean to have a concentration in Turkish studies? It meant that, uh, first of all, you know, you had a chance to do four semesters of, uh, 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 of Turkish reading, uh, 
a text uh, later on in your second year by Halil Inaljik on basically on, a, on an outline of Turkish history. That's where I really got my Turkish grammar down uh, using uh, Neymet's uh, grammar of Turkish, which was impossible to use. I don't know how they used that, but he, he translated his teacher's book. And that's been translated into other languages as well. It's not just the only odd translation. There's a number of people who have translated Neymet's book into various languages I, I've since discovered. He was investing heavily in creating a curriculum. So like the Reichmann Zajinskowski Handbook of Ottoman Diplomatics was intended to support graduate students in Ottoman philology, uh, di diplomatics, the Vicar House of Christomathy, uh, which now of course you can download a PDF of, I, I've never seen an original copy, um, uh, was, is, is one of those things he invested a huge amount of time for teaching uh, Ottoman studies, uh, Ottoman language, and that's one of those things that's disappeared in, in the sale of his uh, library to, to, uh, to Cyprus. Um, so I was able to, in addition to studying uh, Ottoman Turkish and sitting in on his seminar in Turkic studies, and yes, I teach a seminar in Turkic studies myself uh, because of that, um, it, uh, folk liter Turkish folk literature, uh, uh, Ottoman uh, poetry, so uh, uh, Ottoman literature, so poetry, uh, Turkish folk literature, I'm trying to remember, I'd have to look at my transcript, whether I took a third literature uh, course. I will admit publicly that I did not think those were the most important things I was taking. And I should, will hasten to add that in my close to 40 years of teaching, uh, at, when I'm teaching Central Asian literature or dealing with students or, or, or other things, I, I still draw upon that education. That education informs me maybe every day, certainly every week that I'm teaching. And I need to, to point out so that in addition to Ot Turkish language, Ottoman language, a history of the Turks, multiple semester, and of course it was oral exams in good East European style. So I, I didn't do too well uh, in the exams, but I, even access to graduate courses, something on Hungarian proto-history, where I was totally unprepared for it, but he invited me. And this is the beautiful thing that you had this kind of rich environment. Oh, today we talk about trying to have undergraduates do research. At some point as an undergraduate or, or as a graduate, I started driving up to Connecticut on weekends to work on his Mamluk Kupchak dictionary, the Atufat Zakia fi Lughati Turkiya. And I went through the entire thing because by then I had enough Arabic. Uh, and so this was incorporating your students, undergraduate or graduate, into, into research. And so that's just an amazing opportunity. What I'd like to say, as the former director of the Central Asian Studies Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and as the direct, former director of the Middle East Studies Program, and somebody who put together certificate programs and, and investigated things, I don't think you can get an undergraduate education like that in Turkish studies anymore anywhere in the United States, if I am not mistaken. Because I, I, looked, I looked up at a certain point in time, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, the, the, the offerings at every university where I have a colleague, like Seattle, like Bloomington, like Michigan, like Chicago, I don't think you can do an undergraduate major in Turkish language and culture today. You don't teach those courses. What, what, what's attractive to me about my job, which is a tremendous honor, is that I think I can do, replicate that here. Have I, have I burned through all my time? This is all great. This is all wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for these precious memories, um, especially about Tibor Khaleshikun. Uh, I mean, I personally, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I'm sure our audience is also very much enjoying it. We will turn to our audience for their questions. But before that, let us ask our panelists if they're uh, is anything you would like to ask to your co-panelists or if you have any comments to each of each one of you? Uh, I, I know since since I was kind of later in the pipeline towards the end and Tibor Halashikun uh, died in 1991, I'm not sure exactly what year he retired. But so I think I think uh, I know the legends about the role of Fuat Kupterle in all this. And I the, the question is, so uh, can you confirm that this really was Fuat Kupterle deciding that Tibor Halashikun should be sent to Colombia. Is that a verify? Is that verifiable as fact? I 
think I have to unmute myself. One always heard stories, and and Tibor was very very close to Kirkland, um, but I don't know that it's written down anywhere. Uh, as a historian, one likes to have documentary evidence as well as as uh, as as word of mouth. Um, what I I did know what I heard from Tibor uh, directly is that he had been recruited. Uh, someone had come out to Turkey and 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 asked him to 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 come. Uh, they didn't even know if he knew English, which he really didn't, <laughs> and uh, and um, and never really fully mastered. I might add. <laughs> uh, uh, he and I spoke in a very strange language, which was a mix of English, Hungarian, Turkish, and uh, 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 other Slavic languages. Um, uh, which no one else could understand. I mean, it because we jumped from 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 language to language, which which made it a secret language. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, it 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 it, uh, it it's very likely. And of course, you know, he did he did that collection of Kirkland's articles. Uh, Democracy yolunda. Uh, so you know, there was obviously there was a very very close uh, connection. Uh, so I think I think the, the one thing that needs to be said that that I didn't say was that I, I I really think we need to understand that the recruitment the arrival of Tibor Halashikun, uh, who must have had tremendous energy in the 1950s and the early 60s that that wasn't the person that I knew because of, of his declining health, but so it's it's because of him that you had this kind of or he was a certain catalyst. And so, you know, in my understanding, he brings Halil Bey first as a visitor, and then Halil you know, gets recruited. And, you know, as an undergraduate, so I knew Inji Enginun as an undergraduate. I knew Metin Kunt as an undergraduate. I knew Abdullah Kuran as an undergraduate. I don't remember who, who else might have been there. Uh, and, and so this was just an amazing operation. And it, 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 I can't say that Turkish studies did not exist because of course, Menges was hired as a specialist in Old Church Slavonic, but he was a Turkologist. Uh, and uh, Princeton had, I think, Lewis Thomas, and I don't know who else would have been doing what, but this was like the game changer. And because of that, you had this, this sea change. He says that Kupler's reasoning was that if Columbia, he, they won't send the money to Harvard because, it, you know, the, the Harvard will, will do it. But if Columbia does it, Harvard will follow up and, and do it themselves. And that's how Omelian Pritzak went to Harvard in, in the legend. And I see, I see Victor... Uh, may have something to say about that too. But so it was a catalyst for a, a wholesale uh, tsunami overtaking North America and 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 laying the foundation for for Turkish studies. I, I should add that uh, that Menges, whom we've touched on only briefly, was was first in Turkey when he left Germany uh, because his wife is Jewish uh, and so they had to leave. Menges was not. Uh, in Turkey, he was known as Menguhan, uh, <laughs> and it, uh, that, that is how he was usually referred to. <laughs> uh, it, it, brilliant man, but uh, you had to be prepared to, to listen to all sorts of interesting, very interesting sidelines, but interesting things. Yes. We have some raised hands, so let's hear uh, the questions. Um, Nora, Nora Fisher. Hi, um, thank you so much for organizing this. This is such a treat. And uh, I have some questions about, you know, listening to your, um, uh, to your reminiscences and sort of your kind of uh, this biographical account of the sociology of knowledge production um, in uh, in the Turkish studies realm. You know, I'm struck by the sort of the fine grained level of sort of detail and intimacy and relationships that you're discussing and these genealogies and these connections, you know, that have been fostered, you know, that of course took tremendous resources, the resources of the Columbia University and in the context of the sort of the, the genesis of area studies, you know, the resources that were being channeled in sort of U.S. policymaking and academic context in the, you know, sort of in, 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 during the Cold War, which was very much um, evoked by, by, by many of the, the, the powerful stories that you told. Um, and of course, we live in uh, an era where those resources are now, you know, cons uh, 
lacking. Um, and they're lacking in part because there's been an attenuation in policy interest um, in the nuances of area studies. Um, and I think we hear this as much, you know, this is not just a Turkish studies complaint, it's area studies across the board, systematically being, you know, kind of defunded and, and belittled by sort of policymakers who don't kind of recognize the importance of this, this sort of nuanced knowledge. Um, and then also, though, with by markets being, the, the, there's, um, there's the sort of with the neoliberalization of the economy and education, there's that question of you know, what do you do with the Turkish studies degree um, and then of course within the academy itself specifically the political science academy which is where you know, my work intersects with uh, political science and IR um, there's this you know in, um, pressure to produce ever more kind of nomothetic generalizable knowledge that that discounts you know the uh, the ideographic um, sensibilities um, of, of Turkish studies so my question is I'm kind of I'm part of a group that is trying to um, uh, create sort of uh, pushback through through collaboration across area studies categories and across area studies communities um, and I was uh, you know part of the work that I'm trying to do is to to use sort of um, I didn't talk about my work but basically I'm trying in a way to to, to help bridge conversations between Turkish and Middle Eastern studies scholars with uh, Eurasianists and even experts on uh, East Asia and 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 China in the context of uh, an empirical environment a policy environment where Eurasia is resurgent um, so I was struck listening to you talk you know, is, is sort of August Turkologs who speak Russian and uh, Georgian and, uh, and Kazakh and, and Tatar and, and so, you, know, you, you cover already from this very ideographic perspective this vast Eurasian space. Um, so I would wonder what you say to the sort of the prospect and the, 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 the promise and pitfalls of trying to build connections across area studies where there is such a commitment to kind of deep knowledge that it can, you know, verge towards the exceptionalist and can verge to sort of um, difficulty in brokering conversations across, uh, you know, how, how, how can we draw on your experience of sort of Turkology in sort of broad Eurasian perspective to kind of help build area studies today to help the field survive? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> as I, as I always say to, to uh, or said to students uh, years ago that uh, Turkology is wonderful in that you can go from Vienna to Manchuria. So you're not bound by borders. Uh, you can cover a vast area of Eurasia and do a great many different things. Um, and I think we have, uh, area study is very important and it's good to, 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 to know an area well in terms of language, history, culture, and so on but that shouldn't block you from, from expanding into other areas. Uh, Turkology does it naturally. Uh, I was one of uh, Tibor students who was not an Ottomanist, though I took Ottoman Turkish with him. I was not an Ottomanist, I was a Turkologist. So I was doing other Turkic languages um, and uh, there, was a, there was a different focus. Um, but you know the field lent itself to that. Uh, so I think you just, Obviously, so much depends on personalities, but you have to uh, you have to uh, tell students that they should not be bound by uh, a, a, a line on a map. Uh, that uh, that these things go much beyond that, uh, and you should feel free to roam. I mean, I was allowed the first two or three years of my graduate education to basically roam. I was all over the place. Um, and uh, they uh, let uh, Shevchenko and, and Hala Shikun uh, let me do that. Uh, and uh, I think I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I was much the better scholar for it. If I can, if I can follow up on that just a little bit, uh, I, I would agree with Peter. So as a student, I wasn't a part of the Title VI world, the, the, the FLAS fellowship, but during, while teaching at Indiana and, and UW-Madison, of course, I was, uh, as a faculty member, deeply involved in that and trying to recruit students and so on. I think uh, what we see with the Turkic world, you can say the same thing for the Iranian-speaking world, as so, shown by Sanjay Subrahmanyam and, and others, that the Title VI world and those silo-like divisions of, of, of artificial lines on maps are, are very destructive or, 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 or damaging. So, you know, so, so, you know, to be limited, let's say to the post-Soviet world and now South Asia, 
uh, and have that separate from the Middle East, have that being separate from Eastern Europe, is is you know the 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 Turkic world certainly the Ottoman world by itself too, but let's say the Turkic world as a whole shows the 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 lack of intellectual uh, rigor uh, and, and basis for that, and I do think that uh, we just as we need to have uh, disciplines in which which gives us a language for talking to colleagues working on other regions, we also need to talk to colleagues in other regions so that we're not just saying, oh, we're, we're stuck to the borders of the Soviet Union, or oh, no, we can't go beyond, you know, uh, you know, the, the Turkish boundary with Greece or something like that. I think this is really a very, very interesting conversation and takes us back to the origins to the Cold War era and how area studies emerged really, and are they relevant today or should we think about them differently? I would like to address another question. It's factual, but there's a lot behind this question. It's from Hussein Court who asks, uh, let me read it, had there been any encounters with the late Niazi Barkes? Hmm. Why not? <laughs> or I may add another question. Um, you mentioned Köprülü's name a lot during your uh, remarks, but I wonder whether uh, there were other scholars from Turkey spending time at Columbia in the 50s and the 60s. I vaguely remember that Enver Zia Karal spent a year or so here, but uh, I'd like to hear if there were more. Um, maybe the question would go to Professor Evin or Professor Golden. Yes, uh, that's why I mentioned. I cannot recall at, at some point we should get together uh, or from the university archives, uh, get a list of um, those um, uh, revolving uh, professorships. Uh, and Verzia uh, was uh, at Columbia for uh, a year. Um, uh, he, uh, he was uh, he was actually uh, in my defense, uh, as, as I as I recall. Um, and um, there were uh, others from different disciplines and and different. Um, uh, different universities in Turkey. That's uh, one of your um, uh, earlier questions. I think that uh, those bridges were important um, and uh, some senior people uh, uh, could come. Uh, but whether uh, there was um, uh, adequate um, benefit derived from their stay, uh, come uh, to think of it, uh, I don't know, uh, because I think had they been um, brought in to share office space in their own discipline, their, uh, their contribution to Columbia would have been uh, uh, far more beneficial than um, in the confines of uh, sixth floor of Kent Hall, because you have the head of the uh, Turkish Historical Society. Um, you had um, also uh, a, a two uh, very distinguished uh, economic historians uh, from uh, uh, Turkey as well. Um, they, um, I cannot recall the names now because they were not um, they had come earlier. Um, they were not in New York when I was in, in New York, but uh, certainly a constitutional uh, scholar who drafted the 1961 constitution was all, uh, also there. Um, a uh, very uh, interesting uh, scholar of, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, theology school. Uh, who was uh, a, um, a, a good Kemalist uh, at the same time, uh, sort of uh, a, a type of a person uh, that is uh, long forgotten now in the, in the Turkish uh, circles. 
he, uh, uh, Neshet Chatai, uh, the late Neshet Chatai, was um, uh, also very well versed in, in uh, uh, Ottoman uh, literature. Um, uh, yes, uh, certainly there were there were uh, scholars, but the the uh, they would rotate and they would stay uh, one year at a time. Another one, if I just add uh, to what Ahmed said, was Ismet Giritli. That, that's what I meant. Ah, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I recall. Um, Serving as a as a as a translator uh, for him, there were a group of of visiting Soviets, um, and as it turned out, of course, Gritli was fluent in Russian. Uh, something that most people probably didn't know. Whether I, I forget whether his mother was Russian or uh, or uh, a Crimean Tatar uh, and Russian speaking, um, but he was quite fluent in Russian. But uh, Ismet Gritli uh, required to have a bleeper handy because, uh, let's say, his Turkish often took on a very, a very colorful tone, uh, uh, with a a, a a a striking use of uh, four-letter words uh, that made translating for him rather interesting at times. But yes, he was he was one of the one of the visiting scholars uh, there and a very prominent figure. Uh, Viktor Ostapchuk was waiting to address this question. Uh, and there we go. Yes, it's a, it's a, the host. You blocked my meeting. Hi, uh, everybody. I have two questions. Uh, well, and a general comment apropos the discussion we just had. Um, I remember f uh, one time I was at Columbia to give a talk, um, Dacian Rose Murphy and Halashi Kuhn and Tibur Halashi Kuhn. And I remember Tibur Halashi Kuhn was very um, obsessed with the deaf there's. He was really, he was like saying, stressing that the deaf, you know, the, the, this is a fundamental thing and we have to work on them. And I, and I, um, my, 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 one of my hojas, my, my hoj at Harvard, I mean, Prisak, used, used to say that uh, in Turkey, there are maybe a hundred people left in the Ottoman. Okay, in those days. And um, now we have a situation where we have a great boom in, in the field of Ottoman history in, in North America, uh, but there's a turn away from the sources, I would say. Um, there was this, you know, accusation of document fetishes and you could not get a, I, 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 and I had this anecdote that I didn't put in my memo about analogic. You look at analogic's early work, um, which was very source-based, and not, not more source-based than problem-oriented, though it was problem-oriented. Uh, today, a tenure committee would turn their noses on his early work, you know, uh, in, in North America. Um, and now, but now you have a situation where um, Turkey is really, I mean, there's now thousands of people that know Ottoman, know Ottoman well, and they're doing lots of work with the sources, even going back to these uh, Yüksek Lisans tests, these MA theses, where they, where they just take a defter and grind through it, which is a great use if you want working with sigils, as you can find things and so forth. It's just a, a tremendous, I mean, now Turkey really is doing that, is able to do that, and is doing something that is no, no longer, not so much done uh, in North America, working with the, with the sources, resource-based dissertations. I think it's an important point. Um, I have, um, uh, Yuli, I heard you was actually mentioned this thing about Pritzak, but Lashikun's role in bringing Pritzak. I know Pritzak, there's a story of, I never heard this. Pritzak had been invited by Harvard and some, the president lapsed or something. He went to Washington for two years, I believe, and then ended yeah. up at Harvard. But I never heard the story about Halashikun's role in, in, in directing Pritzak to, 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 to Harvard. For, uh, I'm not sure or, about those details, but I think it was Kupperler's reasoning. Oh, really? Yeah. And somewhere in somebody's uh, memoirs, was it Pope's memoir? Somebody else's memoirs, I read something about like, oh, that Pritzak, we got him really cheap at, cheap at Washington. And then, you know, two years later, he leaves. Right, right. Okay, okay. And I have a, a miscellaneous question to Peter Golden. Um, um, you mentioned the ringing, reading f f um, lines of lines of, uh, of old Turkic with Mangus. I had also took a course with Pritzak. I was the only student, uh, and he made me take a course in, in old Turkic inscriptions. And what which inscription did you read? And did you did you read them in the original Turkic in the runic script? No, we didn't. We didn't read them in the no. runic script. We read them mm -hmm. in, in the transcription. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and. Uh, 
it's been a while. I can't remember which of the ones yeah. we read. Probably Kultigin, but I'm, I, you know, I'm not. I wouldn't want to uh, swear on that. Uh, but yeah. I, 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 I will add that uh, since you mentioned the deaf tariffs, uh one of the reasons is that the, the deaf tariffs were the were the first uh, archival uh, documents that really opened up in in the course of the Turkish Republic, and so people mm -hmm. jumped into them. Um, and uh, 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 Tibor was particularly interested in them because he was interested in Hungarian historical geography. And mm -hmm. on the basis of the Ottoman defters, uh, you could put together mm -hmm. the historical, ge the, 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 the early historical geography of Hungary. Um, and mm -hmm. as he told me again and again. <laughs> uh, so yes, I think, I think you know, that was his interest. And Speaking of course- of which, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, see a cloth script and, and all of that. He was he was a master at that. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, th th there is a, a sort of a feature about the way Ottoman uh, historical studies have developed, but they're going fat in phases, phases and fads. There's defters, 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 then it's mohimas, 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 then it's civils, civils, civils. Uh, there's infatuation with the source and then eventual uh, disillusionment. But apropos of the inscriptions, Pritzak loved loved this, the thing he loved more than anything in the world was the, the inscriptions. And he made me made me look, do it in, in the old script, in the yeah. Runic script. Uh, so yeah. I, have my, I have my notes here and his annotations basically between the lines of, of Tonyo Kuk, which was on, which to him was the was the peak of the peak of, of all the inscriptions eventually. And that's probably why I didn't become a Turkologist because they made me read him in the old in the old script, but I'm trying to relearn it now. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Can, can I add one random thought? Oh, one of the things I, I mean, I'm a Turkologist uh, and I, I, maybe I'm many things. And, and so I did not have a chance to study the old Turkic inscriptions because of the way the program was set up at Columbia until I got to Hungary in 82. And there were other things too I couldn't study at Columbia. But uh, I have never lost my appreciation for uh, the rigorous training in Ottoman philology that I received. So I think that's kind of like learning Latin. And they talk about the importance of learning Latin because of its rigor and what it teaches you. So I think that uh, I, I would not want to develop a, a graduate program in Turkology here where Ottoman language was not, was not uh, central to it because of, of, of the rigor and the, the depth of that field. Uh, and so I would not want to have some a program where doctoral students are only reading Abu Ghazi, Bahadur Khan, Shejiri, Türk, and nothing else, because that, that those those don't world two worlds don't can't be compared. And I think that you know what a part of what I'm trying to do is also bring Ottoman studies to to Central Asia. We have we do have an Ottomanist on, on our faculty uh, from Halit Akarja from from Prince who did his PhD at Princeton. And I think one of the things is that, yes, in, in Turkey now, uh, I think you don't have to worry about whether people can read Ottoman. But I think in the former Soviet, I mean, Uzbekistan is a different world, but in a place like Kazakhstan, where you still have tons of uncatalogued archival materials, publications from the 19th century that nobody can read, uh, early Kazakh works for, through the 1920s that people can't read in the original, it's, it's good to, to have training in, in Arabic script texts. And for there, the Cadillac subject should be Ottoman philology. So I'm just thinking for, for um, Tunj Bey and others, you know, if, if there needs to be some uh, argument for why Ottoman is, uh, Ottoman is important, it's, it's, you know, for us, it's kind of like the, you know, the same arguments as, as for learning, let's say Latin or Greek. It's also which I of, didn't learn, but still, yeah. Peter it's a, sure. it's a triple threat language with the Arabic and Persian and Turkish. And I, sure. what I realized now with some of the documents I've been working on recently, that really very few people really know Ottoman well. I mean, there are things that we do not understand philologically. And for example, give take the optative, so called optative subjunctive, which has actually five different meanings from a from a, a comparative meaning to a, a to a, um, a conditional and several shades in between. There are things that we really do not have a good handle on. It's a really very humbling experience to work with Ottoman. <laughs> Even after all these years, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> very interesting. I saw a hand and it's Leticia. I do not know your last name, Leticia. Forgive me, but could you ask your question now, please? After unmuting yourself. Um, I and have enjoyed this so much. I came to Columbia in 1950, 
um, nine after having majored in Middle Eastern history at, at Radcliffe and taken Langer's course in Ottoman history with uh, Spiros Rionis um, being hand, handed the section on, on the Greek uh, background and part, part of Ottoman history and um, struggling with Arabic. And later on, I had Kathleen Burl. I, I went to her and had her course in, in uh, Turkish, basic Turkish, and I fell in love with Turkish as compared to the, all the Arabic I've been struggling with. And um, later I lived in Princeton and I saw her there as well as uh, wonderful Charles Isawi. And um, she was so distraught that Turkish was stopped at Columbia. And she felt she had given her life to, to that field at Columbia and it had all gone down the drain. Um, so that's, I just, and I love the memories of, of I did my dissertation with, with uh, J.C. Hurwitz and hearing all these names. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, one thing I would like to add is that there is also a pure history of Turkish studies at Columbia, I mean, pre-World War II history. I mean, Ahmet Emin Yalman, for instance, spent time here at Columbia University in the 1910s, uh, and he wrote a dissertation on um, the journalism in 19th century Ottoman world. There is another figure, interesting figure in the 1910s, actually, I'm trying to re recall her name, Hester Donaldson Jenkins, who was a professor at Americans College, uh, American Girls College in Istanbul, but also doing PhD here in the Oriental Studies, I believe uh, it was called Oriental Studies by then, and she wrote a dissertation on Ibrahim Pasha in 16th century. Um, so the history of the Turkish studies here at Columbia University has even, a, you know, greater um, a history than, uh, than um, the Cold War era um, interest. So I just wanted to add that to our wonderful conversation so far. Uh, we have little time left, but we can take maybe another question or uh, two before we close our um, session today. If uh, any of shall you- we, Shall we add Sabiha Sertel to your list? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> One of those legendary figures that passed through Columbia. Mm -hmm. The, the chat also mentioned Halide Edip, who was at Barnard for uh, a bit. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so, I, I've never read anything detailed about her uh, time there. Erika Gilson uh, has a question. Yes. Um, first of all, <laughs> am I on? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. I I want to thank for all the organizers for doing this. It was been wonderful. It was great to see Ahmed Evin after all these years. He was the one who actually signed off on my dissertation, even though he said he didn't read it. He didn't know anything about it, but he has no problem signing off. It was my advisor was Halashikun because when I finished at the University of Pennsylvania with my prelims that particular day, actually, the then professor there, uh, uh, Osman, Osman Nedim Tuna, Nedim Tuna. <laughs> right, was, uh, uh, was his, his uh, contract was not renewed and he was let go. So I was left standing and I was told to go up and down the East Coast. There was some kind of consortium. I could find an advisor to, write my dissertation. I uh, did go up all the way to Harvard, uh, down, 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 and I settled on Tibor <laughs> at Columbia. And so 
I know you live from that time and certainly Peter also. It was wonderful to see you all. And it was great to see you, Leticia. Thank you. Thank you. Carry on. <laughs> Well, um, before we finish, I would like to raise our glasses to two wonderful women who are still with us, apparently. One of them is Zeynep Korkmaz, and the other one is Nina Gargosyan. Garsoyan. Garsoyan, sorry, Garsoyan, and I knew her. So let's celebrate them before we say goodbye. Absolutely, absolutely. 100%. And any final words from anybody? Tunch, where are you? Thank you very much. Uh, We're very grateful to you for this extremely lively and I think memorable conversation. And next time you watch Hannah and her sisters, Woody Allen's film, remember Milak because Kent Hall's in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again in our uh, upcoming events.